So for our next installment of our discussion about um, community ecology, um, we're going to talk about um, symbiotic relationships and we're also going to talk about predation. So remember that community ecology is all about interactions between species, right? So we've already talked about competition quite a bit, okay, in a couple different areas of competition. Um, symbiotic relationships, so the word symbiotic, so you already know bio means life, right? Sim means together. So quite literally, symbiotic means living together. And so where, did, where is the line for that? Um, essentially, the idea is that symbiotic relationships are relationships where um, two or more um, species are so like either physically together or their relationship is so closely tied together that um, we put them in this category. Okay. So very close physically or otherwise close relationships. between species. And this will make sense, of course, as we as we talk about examples, okay? Physical or not. Okay, so, um, so that's what the word symbiotic means, all right? Now, you'll notice that in that definition, there's no like value judgment. There's nothing that says it's a positive relationship, it's a negative relationship, right? There's, there's nothing that says that in there, okay? Because literally symbiotic just means that living together, right? It doesn't mean, it doesn't have a, it doesn't have any indication of positive, negative or otherwise, okay? As it turns out, <laughs> there are lots of different types of symbiotic relationships. And so the ones that people talk about the most are mutualism and parasitism, but another one is called commensalism. And so we're going to start with um, just kind of an overview, and then we're going to go through some examples um, to just kind of really be, because it's really fascinating to look at um, how intricate some of these relationships are. And you actually um, learned about some of these in the evolutionary arms race. If you, you know, when you watch that movie, um, it talks about some really good examples of um, mutualisms in that video. I, I hope you notice, I hope you are noticing that there's a lot of blur and overlap between when we talk about ecology and when we talk about evolution, because fundamentally, ecology is what determines evolution and evolution ultimately affects ecology, right? So they're, they're such closely tied topics that you kind of can't talk about one with talk, without talking about the other. Yeah. So that's why you're seeing a lot of, you know, kind of things that are kind of going back and forth between those two topics. Okay. Sorry, tangent. So let's get back to what we were talking about with symbiotic relationships. So like I said, they can be positive, they can be negative, they can be neutral. And so typically the way that we do that shorthand, the way that we write it is in a mutualism, we often write it as a plus plus relationship because the interaction that's occurring is beneficial to both species that are involved. And so the example you're seeing here is you're seeing a honeybee and that honeybee is visiting a flower and um, both partners are benefiting. So how is the honeybee benefiting? The honeybee is benefiting because it is getting nectar and it is getting pollen. Um, and so it's getting fed. Okay. How is the plant benefiting? Well, the, the plant is benefiting because flowers contain pollen, which are these really small structures that contain sperm. And so essentially what's happening is our honeybee friend here is acting as a little sperm delivery service for the plant, right? So it picks up pollen from the plant and takes it to another plant to allow it to reproduce, okay? So both partners are benefiting, right? The bee is getting food, the plant is getting assistance with reproduction, okay? Make you change the way you think about flowers from now on. All right. Um, 
So that's a mutualism. Both partners are benefiting. Okay. Then we have on the other extreme, we have parasitism and it's not pictured in here. So I'm going to write it down here. And so I'm going to say parasitism. And we'll look at a bunch of examples of parasitism in a second, but parasitism is a plus minus relationship. So what does that sound like? What, what could that possibly be? Um, so once again, it's a symbiotic relationship. So one organism is living in or on another one and one is benefiting and one is harmed. Okay. So most of you have heard of parasites before. And so we're going to talk about all kinds of examples that are fun and entertaining. Um, but the idea there is that in that relationship in of those two partners, one of them is taking something and the other one is being harmed in some way. Okay. And so we'll look at a bunch of examples. The one that's a little less, I don't know, obvious. It's a little, it happens, but it's not, it's not as sort of clear cut is something called commensalism and commensalism is a plus zero, meaning that it's a neutral interaction for one species and a positive for the other. Okay. So in this particular example, they're showing these wildebeest or muskox or whatever the heck that is, some large bovine. Okay. Um, and there, and you can see that there's a little, um, a bird on its head. <laughs> okay. And so, um, that is a cattle egret and cattle egrets are, um, kind of cool birds. They, um, the reason they call them cattle egrets is they tend to follow cattle. They tend to spend a lot of time in fields with cattle, whether they be wild like this or domesticated cattle. And the reason they do that is because as the cattle are, you know, tromping around, you know, through the grass eating, right, the cattle will kick up bugs. And so, right, and so the um, cattle egrets come in and they eat the bugs, they eat the grasshoppers that are startled when the cow comes along. So it's beneficial to the egret, to the bird, because it gets a, a free meal, right, or it's easier to catch its food. But it whether or not there are egrets there is of no benefit or no harm to the cattle, right? It doesn't, it doesn't matter one way or the other. Okay. Another example of commensalism that I like to think about is um, if a barnacle, we talked about barnacles in the last video, if a barnacle found itself attached to a whale, right? Well, whales are so big that one barnacle on their skin isn't going to be a big deal. It's, it's not going to harm them. It's not going to benefit them, but it's not going to harm them, right? But the benefit for the barnacle is now as the whale moves through the water, the barnacle has access to all kinds of foods and, you know, whatnot. So that will be another example of um, commensalism, okay? Anyway, so we're going to spend most of our time talking about mutualisms and parasitisms because those are the ones that are, you know, the most exciting, <laughs> okay? On, I'm just I'm being honest. Commensalisms are kind of like, whatever. Okay, that's fine. All right. So this, this mutualism, um, I haven't told you guys yet this. I don't think maybe I did. I don't know. Anyway, um, my research when I was in graduate school was on ants specifically, um, you know, by training, I'm a community ecologist, right? I, what I was studying is I was studying the relationship between a particular species of local ants and two different um, local shrubs, okay, native shrubs. And I was looking at, you know, how, what, how those species impact each other, how they affect each other. Um, so hence my interest in community ecology. Um, and I like ants. So, <laughs> so here is a story, and this is a great story. These ants, um, you don't need to know the name, but if you're curious, they're called Pseudomermex ants. Um, and they are currently on a plant um, that's called an acacia plant. Once again, the names aren't important, but the story is, you know, a, a good story of mutualism. So what you see in this image here is you see two ants and they are in the process of cutting off these yellow structures on the tips of the leaves. Those little yellow structures are filled with fat, right? Fat and protein. And the plant makes those little fatty structures and there is no particular benefit to the plant of making those structures other than that they attract ants. 
Okay, so those fatty structures are of no benefit to the plant. In fact, if anything, they have to, you know, expend a lot of energy to make them. Okay, um, but they act as food for the ants. Okay, another fun part of this story is these ants live in thorns on the acacia tree. So the acacia tree, I'm going to draw like there's a branch. Okay, and here's a thorn on the side of the branch, right? So branch. Right, there's a thorn. The thorns have these little holes at the bases and the ants actually like excavate the tissue that's inside of the thorn and they make that their little nest, okay? All right, so far this is sounding like a cushy deal for the ants. You can see how they're benefiting because remember mutualism is plus plus, right? So what are the ants getting out of it? The ants are getting food that's being grown for them. Um, the ants get a house to live in, right? So life is looking really good for the ants. But if it's a mutualism, there has to be a benefit to the plant too, right? So what's the benefit to the plant? Um, this is just absolutely adorable, okay? So the ants, this particular species, and quite frankly, many species of ants have stingers, right? And this particular species of ant are very protective of their home. And so ants as a general rule tend to be very, ter very territorial. The ones that live in our houses are not, they're kind of a, the weird exception to that. But generally ants are extraordinarily territorial and they'll fight with other ants, right? That are, that are from a different nest um, than theirs. And you know, it's, it's ugly. Um, so they're generally very territorial. These ants and their stingers will, um, go out of their way to protect that tree okay so they live in the savanna in like africa right and so an herbivore like a i don't know giraffe i'm just i'm making stuff up, okay some sort of larger herbivore comes along to eat the leaves right but what the ants do is they sense a disturbance they they feel the rustling and they run over and they sting that herbivore and chase them away right so the ants are like bodyguards for the plant for the tree Okay, so that's only one way they protect them. Also, what the ants do, and this is even crazier, is surrounding the base of the tree, if any other type of plant starts to germinate there, right, that might compete with the tree for water or for sunlight or anything, the ants will go and they will cut down those little tiny seedlings before they have a chance to grow very large at all essentially keeping away competitors so that that tree doesn't have any competitors around it. Isn't that cool? So they're like their bodyguards from herbivores from getting eaten, but they're also making it so that competitors don't even come by, right? Other, other plants, right? And so this is a really tight mutualism because this type of ant is only found associated with acacia trees. They always live in acacia trees, right? You won't see this species of ant living anywhere else, okay? And this particular type of acacia tree is so dependent on the ants to be their bodyguards that the acacia trees, if they don't have any ants, don't do very well at all. They typically die, right? So you almost always see them in this relationship together. So that's mutualism, okay? Not all mutualisms are that strict, right? Sometimes they're, you know, they can live without each other. But in this particular case, not so much, okay? So this is now the second example of an ant mutualism that you've heard, right? So you heard this one, and then in evolutionary arms race, it was talking about um, uh, leaf cutter ants and their fungus and the bacteria and the whole, like the whole thing, right? And that's a really interesting story. So um, actually, this is a really good idea for something to talk about in, um, in a Zoom this week is to talk a little bit about um, what were all the different community ecology, what were all the different relationships that were happening in that story, right? Just kind of as a review for all of these different things. It might be kind of cool. Okay, so anyway. All right, so that's mutualism. Um, a fun and much more local um, example of parasitism, right? So remember parasitism is a plus minus relationship, right? Because one partner benefits, the other one is harmed. Um, this particular organism, this orange pile of stuff, right? Um, 
is local. You can see it actually, the place where I see it most often, um, where you might also see it is on um, like next to the freeway. <laughs> Right. So if you see just the native shrubs, right, the plants that just live out in nature here um, and you see one that looks like somebody sprayed it with like orange silly string or like there was some sort of orange netting that got caught on it and is like sitting on top of a shrub. It's it's neither of those things. It's actually this plant, which is called daughter, D-O-D-D-E-R. You don't need to know that, but I'm just in case you're curious. There's all kinds of other funny names for it, too, like devil's devil's uh, hair and hellbane and um there's all kinds of weird names about it because it's um because it kind of like climbs onto its host plant it's really strange so when we talk about um parasitism we talk about the parasite and we talk about the host okay so in this case daughter is a parasite so the parasite is the one that's benefiting right and the host plant is the one that is harmed. And um, in the case of daughter, there, it can be, there can be lots of different host plants that can, can become infected with daughter. Um, and essentially what daughter does is you're looking at it and you're like orange and you're like, that doesn't look like a plant. Um, so, you know, in organism of the day, day, week, one of the things I'm trying to get you to think about, and I'm trying really hard, and some of you are resisting me, okay? But what I'm trying to get you to think about is you say, okay, well, I know that's in kingdom plant A because it's a plant. But my question to you is, well, how do you know it's a plant? Because it's a plant. Well, how do you know, <laughs> right? And so, okay, so you're looking at this orange thing and you're like, that doesn't look like a plant to me, okay? Um, and I will grant you, it does not look like a plant. It's a very unique plant. And one of the things that's unique about it is that um, the vast majority of plants have um, structures called chloroplasts inside of their cells, which we'll talk about when we get to cell biology. Um, and they photosynthesize, that's their way of getting nutrition, okay? And so that is the most sort of typical situation you have with plants. This particular plant, um, or the daughter, right? This particular plant um, is um, non-photosynthetic, which is why it's orange. It doesn't have any chloroplasts in it. And what it does is it has these little roots that actually like burrow into the host plant and it can actually like suck nutrients out of the host plant, right? And it doesn't need to photosynthesize by itself at all. So it basically just feeds off of the host. Okay, so it's pretty, uh, it's pretty weird, right? And daughter, it's a flowering plant, actually. At the right time of year, if you're looking really closely and it's the right time of year, it has these little tiny white flowers on it. Um, and so it has a life cycle where it, when it's wet, so like in the rainy season, it's all big and, you know, kind of luscious. And then in the summer, it like dries out and gets like super crispy and, you know, kind of fades away to, um, to like nothing by the time you get to the end of summer when it's been really, really hot. Um, so anyway, so that's an example of a plant parasite, okay? A plant that is a parasite on a host plant. Anyway, okay. Um, parasites, I could talk about parasites forever. Um, if, you're, if you're into this sort of thing, there's this great book called Parasite Rex. And I can't remember if it's by Sean Carroll. I'll have to get back to you on that. I can't remember if it's by Sean Carroll. I, I think I have it at school. I don't think it's at home. Dang it. Anyway, it might be by Sean Carroll or who's that other guy? Okay, I'll let you know later. Anyway, um, it's a great book. It talks about all these different like weird, like creepy parasites. It's amazing. It's a great book. Anyway, um, parasites as a general rule fall into two categories. You can talk about a parasite being an ectoparasite or an endoparasite. And so ectoparasites live on the outside of their host. So this is a mite in this picture, but fleas, um, mosquitoes, leeches, uh, lice, right? Those would all be examples of ectoparasites, right? They don't live inside of their host. They live on the outside of their host. 
okay? Whereas endo means inside, and so endoparasites live inside of their host. So endoparasites, this particular one that's here, that um, red cells are red blood cells, and the little purple, they look like purple squigglies, that's plasmodium, that's the organism that causes malaria, okay? So malaria is a parasite. Um, well, malaria is a disease caused by a parasite called plasmodium, but anyway, okay? Um, yeah, so um, what's another example of a parasite? Um, basically any kind of uh, bacteria that makes you sick also technically is a parasite. Um, other endoparasites would be um, all different kinds of worms, uh, hookworms, roundworms, tapeworms, heartworms. Those are all examples of endoparasites that you may or may not be familiar with. Um, this little factoid here at the bottom is pretty uh, amazing <laughs> because um, it seems really shocking, but when you think about it, it actually isn't really that surprising. So there are, there may be as many as three to four times as many parasitic species as non-parasitic species on earth. And that seems like what? I didn't know there were that many parasites. That's terrifying. Um, but if you think about it, being a parasite is a good way to go, man, right? If you think about it, okay? You live on a host and it, you get something from it. You get food from it. Sometimes you get food and shelter, right? And parasites generally don't kill their host. Or if they do, um, they get have some mechanism of getting from their host that they're in the process of killing to a new host, okay? Um, so parasites, being a parasite is a very, um, it's an excellent strategy for how to make a living, right? Because um, it often, you know, offers a certain amount of protection, right? A certain amount of food. It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty impressive, okay? Um, and so one really kind of interesting thing is that because parasites do often cause harm to their host, um, there's this really like delicate balance. Um, and so some parasites are, um, don't cause enough harm to really damage their host. So like, I'm thinking about, oh, like a mosquito bite, right? Now, unless you live in a place where you're getting some other disease transmitted by a mosquito, just if you have a mosquito that bites you that doesn't have anything else inside of its body, it's mildly irritating. The, the amount of blood they take is not enough to impact you, right? So, you know, whatever, it's no big deal, okay? Um, that's different though, if you live in a place with some sort of mosquito-borne illness that is carried by mosquitoes, that can be real bad, okay? So some parasites don't do much harm to their hosts, right? Their influence is really small. Um, some ultimately can kill their hosts, but all of them have some mechanism of getting from one host to another. So like in the case of mosquito, they just fly from one host to another, right? Um, in the case of endoparasites, that's a little bit trickier, right? So if you're an ectoparasite on the outside, yeah, it's pretty easy to get from one host to another. So if you, if any of you, when you were kids or have had kids or, you know, when you were a kid went to school, um, there's this funny thing that happens with lice with elementary schools, right? Like one kid gets lice and like, boom, the whole school has lice, right? Because kids tend to like play and touch each other and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, and because it's an ectoparasite, right, that's on your head, it easily can jump from one person to another person, right? No problem, okay? So it's, it's you know, it's, it's kind of tricky, right? So kids, uh, often you hear about, you know, kids getting lice from school from elementary school. Um, anyway, so ectoparasites, it's usually pretty easy to get from one host to another host. Um, endoparasites are a little bit trickier. So um, often they have to have some mechanism of getting out of their host. So they come out and poop maybe, that's one way. If you're a worm, an intestinal worm, you come out in the poop. Um, but then you have to have a way of getting into the next host. Okay, and there are, there are a lot of parasites that, that go that, they call it the fecal oral route, okay? 
go for poop to being consumed. Um, and so Giardia is a good example of that. This is the reason, by the way, that we drink water that's been purified, right? So, you know, if you're going on a hike and you're like, look at that beautiful clear stream, I'm just, I'm going to drink from that beautiful clear stream. Don't do it. Don't do it. Because even though the water looks clean, you know, maybe earlier that morning, some deer, you know, pooped in it <laughs> when it came to have a drink a little while ago. And that beer, that deer probably had worms. And so now guess what you're drinking? <laughs> Worm eggs. Hmm. Okay. So yeah. So that's one way. Um, in this particular example, they're talking about rabies. And so um, <laughs> the foaming at the mouth, right? That's how rabies gets transmitted from one, um, from one host to a new host. And the rabies virus also changes the behavior of the host, right? So rabid animals um, are really aggressive and prone to biting. Yeah. And that's because the virus alters their brain and makes them aggressive. And it's entirely so that the virus can be transmitted from one individual to another because it has to enter through the bloodstream, right? So foamy saliva, you know, into the next host. Okay. Never handle wild animals, y'all. Bats sometimes have rabies. Um, Possums can, raccoons do a lot. So don't handle, don't handle wild animals. Okay. It's bad. If they bite you, it's not good. Not good. Rabies is nasty. Okay. So that is, where am I? Where am I? Okay. So that is um, kind of the total of our symbiotic relationships. Okay. Um, th like I said, there's a million fun examples of all of these things. Okay. That are really interesting to think about. And so, you know, if you want to know more, you know, there's all kinds of places. Carl Zimmer, that's his name. So the author of Parasite Rex, I can't remember if it's Sean Carroll or, or Carl Zimmer. It's one of them. It's funny how I'm leaving and then it pops in my head. Anyway, okay. One other, re the other main relationship that we're going to talk about today is we're going to talk about predator prey relationships. So we're going to talk about predation. Um, one very important thing to realize here is that actually the difference between a parasite and a predator isn't a very big difference as it turns out. Okay, so a parasite, remember parasitism is a plus minus relationship, right? The parasite is benefited, the host is harmed. In predation, predators are also, it's a plus minus relationship, but it's a plus minus relationship where the predator kills, you know, and often consumes the entirety of their prey, right? So whereas parasites, you know, work on their host slowly and incrementally and may or may not kill them um predators always kill their prey basically at least when they're successful okay so um kind of there's some similarities but there's differences you know significant differences as well so when we talk about predation we're going to talk about a few different things about predation we're going to talk about um some of the different attributes of predators. We're gonna talk about different kinds of predation and we're gonna talk about some of the different defense mechanisms that prey have, yeah? So when we talk about predation, um, you know, the definition of predation is one species eating another species basically, okay? So predation um, always is a plus minus, like I said, but it's a plus minus that leads to death. Okay. Um, typically when it's um, animal on animal violence, <laughs> we call it predation, but um, herbivory is another type of predation. So herbivory is when an animal eats a plant. Oh, I hear my pickle outside. Hubs, hubs and daughter are home from the store. Okay. Um, 
So herbivory, when, when animals are eating plants, is an, is an example of predation, even though you don't think of it as, you know, when we talk about predators, everybody always thinks about like lions and, you know, tigers and stuff. They don't think about that. Um, predators often have all kinds of different weapons or tools that allow them to be successful. So this ugly cuss right here is an angler fish. Um, and they're called that because an angler is, is a like a fisherman. It's another word for like a fisherman. And so they're called an angler fish because they have this little bioluminescent thingy above their head and they live in super, super deep dark water, right? And so the fish, the only reason you can see this is because there's a light shining on it, right? But the fish is basically like completely hidden. And it has this little, you know, doodad on its head that it jiggles and it's bioluminescent. And so some smaller fish sees that little thing and is like, oh, oh, a snack and comes over to eat it. And then, you know, there's this was in Finding Nemo, I think, or Dory, one of them. Anyway, <laughs> OK, so anglerfish. So um, predators often have all kinds of tools. Predators often have lures. So that's an example of a lure right, to entice their prey. Um, they often have all kinds of, I'm just going to say weapons. So fangs, um, stingers, sharp teeth. Um, sometimes they have uh, poison or venom, etc. So they often have things to subdue their prey. Now, if you're an herbivore, you don't need to subdue your prey because <laughs> your prey is not running away from you. Okay. So if we're talking about a deer or some herbivore. They don't have these kinds of tools. Right. But if we're talking about animal on animal predation, right. Then they, uh, predators often have tours, have tools. I can talk. Okay. Um, but the prey, right. Actually, let's go back up here. So predator is the, Oh, predator is the plus prey is the minus, okay? So in um, our predator-prey relationships, there are often um, all kinds of defenses that um, prey have to avoid being eaten, okay? So mechanical defenses like having spines. Look at that porcupine right there. Nobody wants to mess with a porcupine because you're going to get a mouthful of pain, okay? Um, chemical defenses. So having either poison or like really bad tasting things on the surface of your skin. A lot of frogs do this. So that's a, um, some sort of, you know, tropical, uh, rainforest tree frog guy. Um, they often also have bright colors and those bright colors are an example of warning coloration. In addition to, you know, over here, an example of warning coloration. Um, Predators usually, because predators often have, um, have to be fast and agile and have to be like smart to catch their prey, often predators can learn, right? And so if a predator catches a frog and like tries to chew it up and it's all like bitter and nasty and the predator's like, <laughs> right? Maybe the next time it sees a bright blue frog, it will think, yeah, the last time I tried to do that, it didn't go well, right? It tasted gross or it made me really sick, right? So a lot of times um, prey have um, warning coloration that basically says like, hey, you remember me from last time. Don't, don't mess with me, okay? Um, and often those patterns are found wildly in um, all kinds of different species. So having a pattern of like black and orange or black and white is used in lots and lots of different insects, right? So this monarch butterfly, um, monarch butterflies are interesting because they are toxic, not because they make poison themselves, but because of their diet. So monarch butterflies eat milkweed, which is pretty toxic. It's, it's, it's not a good thing. You don't wanna have milkweed growing in your yard if you have pets or kids or anybody, uh, right? And so, um, so monarch butterflies are toxic because of what they eat, but it protects them. And they have this warning coloration that basically tells the predator, if you eat me, you're going to get sick. You're going to get real sick. 
right? So leave me alone. I got the warning color. Um, there's also camouflage. So you've seen examples of this before. There's a beautiful praying mantis that looks like just like a twink, right? Um, here's some more good camouflage. Um, so, I mean, you guys can see them pretty well because you can see their eyes, but imagine if this guy was like laying flat on those leaves. He'd be real easy to miss, right? And this dude, look at him in all this little duckweed. He's pretty well camouflaged too, okay? Now, sometimes camouflage is effective enough on us and other times it's not super effective for us, okay? So let's look at these two examples. So first let's address the bird, okay? So you're looking at this bird over here and you're like, um, that bird is not camouflaged at all. I can totally see the bird. What are you talking about, Sarah? Um, so that bird, it's called a least bittern. And these birds live, they make their nests and you can see the little babies, right? The little fuzzballs down there. They make their nests on like little mounds of stuff that's like floating in um, wetlands. And so there's all these like cattails and other aquatic plants all surrounding it, right? And they build these nests that are kind of like sitting on top of the water. Um, and so these guys to us don't look very camouflaged, right? But what they do when they sense that there might be a predator nearby and their predators, by the way, don't have great color vision. So part of the reason why we can see this guy really well is because we can clearly see the difference between the green and like the white, right? But if you can't see green, if green just looks gray to you, right? What they do is they kind of sit there on their nest and they stretch out their neck and they put their beak up and then they just kind of sway like the breeze blowing the cattails and they just kind of blend in, right? So that would be an example of camouflage that wouldn't work for us if we were their predator, but it does work for their actual predators, okay? Let's talk about the picture on the left, right? So what's going on in that picture to the left? Rocks, it's a bunch of rocks. Look carefully. Do you see any rocks that look different? You see rocks that kind of look like, I don't know, like butt cheeks or something, right? So there's one, there's another one. Yeah, you see these? Those are in fact not rocks, they are plants called stone plants. Um, and they are extremely well camouflaged in very rocky soil. Right, so it's, you know, unless you kind of get the feel for that pattern of looking for the splitting. So those are the two leaves, which is why it looks like it's split in two because there's two leaves. Um, so yeah, right, here's another one back here. Yeah, so that's good camouflage. Okay, so even plants use camouflage sometimes. It's not just animals that do camouflage. Plants can, can be camouflaged as well. Okay, um, here's more of those poison dart frogs. They, they have that name because, um, the native folks that live in the rainforests or lived because most of them had been you know chased out by logging and whatever so the native people that lived in um the rainforests would use these guys against their enemies so they call them poison dart frogs or poison arrow frogs because what they would do is they'd take one of these frogs and they'd heat them up and basically they'd like cook them Right, and so that all the toxin that's in the frog's skin like bubbles out of their skin and they would take their arrowheads or their darts and wipe it in that poison. And then they would use these poisoned arrows to shoot at their enemies. <laughs> How's that for mean warfare? So they're called poison dart frogs. Super cute though, most of them are teeny and they're all brightly colored and have beautiful patterns and people keep them as pets all the time because they're just super cute. We had, back when I was at Cal Poly, I doubt this is true anymore, but back when I was at Cal Poly, they had a really cool terrarium in the department office that had like, I don't know, like a dozen different kinds of poison dart frogs. They were just, they were super adorable. It was fun to go in there and like look at them while you were waiting for something. Um, so yeah, so those are some examples. Um, there's also hiding, of course, or escaping, right? So um, one really good defense that makes sense for a lot of fish is schooling. Because if you're in a big school, it's harder for the predator, even though the predator can see all of you there, right? As a single individual, your chances of getting eaten are smaller because they can't focus on just you, right? So if they see you by yourself, it's a lot easier for them to find and eat you. But if you're in a big group, you can kind of like blend in with the masses and disappear essentially, right? Um, 
I love this fighting back picture. I love that this is a little baby bird that's vomiting on somebody as a way of defense. Um, frogs pee as a defense mechanism. Um, I know this from personal experience. I grew up um, all over the US, as you know. One of the places we lived was Pennsylvania and we literally had like woods behind our house, it was just woods. And so we had all kinds of, you know, critters and we had frogs and whenever, and um, when you catch a frog, right? The first thing they do is they pee all over you and it's disgusting because they're trying to gross you out so you let them go. Anyway, um, sometimes you see other behavioral defenses like mobbing. Um, and this actually you see a lot with birds. So um, here you're looking at a couple of, uh, those are probably crows, not ravens, but anyway, um, and you're looking at an owl. And so that owl probably was interested in the nest of, of one of those crows and the crows are like, nah. So even though if it was like a one-to-one -one fight between an owl and a crow, the owl would probably win. Although, you know, I don't know that that would ever happen. Um, birds will fight back, even little birds, right? Um, often in numbers. So a lot of times you'll see um, a bunch of like little birds chasing away some sort of big scary bird, right? Um, just being like, nah, you stay out of here because strength in numbers, right? And they'll defend themselves. Um, so yeah, so we see that occasionally we'll see that in our yard. We get um, not big hawks, but we get small hawks like sharp shinned hawks and Cooper's hawks. And you'll see a bunch of like mockingbirds be like, nah, get out of here. You're not welcome here. This is especially true when they have babies in the nest. They're really, they're much more protective then, obviously, than if you know, otherwise. Um, this is a super cute example of a um, defense against predation. This is um, a type of bird called a killdeer. And these are shore birds, meaning that they typically live, you know, close to water, um, but they actually live very far inland too. There's a whole bunch of them that live on the Rancho campus, um, Chafee's Rancho campus, a whole like ton of them live there. Um, and because they are, they're ground, they just run around on the ground. They can fly, but they spend most of their time just like running around like eating bugs and whatnot. And um, they build their nest on the ground, which is like super vulnerable. Um, and so what they do if a predator um, comes to an area is the, the parents will fly away from the nest and put on a big show about being injured Right. So that's what this guy is doing right now. It's like, oh, my wing is broken. Ah and they flap around like they're dying. Right. And, you know, the idea being that then the predator is like, oh, I'm going to go get that one because that's going to be an easy catch before the predator sees the nest. Right. And then the adult, once the predator gets, you know, close that they're now away from the nest, then the adult just flies away. <laughs> so they do all this weird like distraction stuff. It's pretty, it's pretty cool. My goal in life is to get one of the killed here on campus to do this for me. Um, but I've never been, apparently I've never found where their nests are because I've never got them to, because normally they just fly away from you. <laughs> you have to be close to their nest for them to do this. So anyway, I still, I have hope. I got another, I'll probably be working for at least another 20 years. So I got time. Okay. Um, there's also, and this is kind of like camouflage, but not exactly. Um, a phenomenon called mimicry. And so mimicry is where um, one species mimics or looks like another species. And there's a couple different kinds of mimicry. One of them is called Bates mimicry. And so Bates mimicry is where um, you have one species that is harmful or tastes bad there's something negative about them. And there's another species that is not harmful and tasty and delicious that mimics the one that's harmful or tastes bad, okay? So what you're looking at in this picture, and you're, I know you're not gonna believe me because nobody ever does until you, know, you see it and it's in your book too. Um, <laughs> on the right is a green tree snake. On the left is a caterpillar right? And that caterpillar, its butt looks just like the head of a snake, just like the head of the snake. It even makes a hissing sound and it even moves like a snake. They kind of do this like thing, like they're like a snake, right? And so the idea is that a bird normally would love to eat a delicious, fat, juicy caterpillar, right? Not harmful at all, tasty and fantastic, yeah? But birds 
learn that in tree, at least in you know the areas where these critters live, that tree snakes are dangerous because they'll bite you and hurt you, <laughs> right? So the birds learn to avoid snakes. And so by looking quite a bit like a snake, right, these caterpillars get to um, get, a, get a free pass, right? They get avoided by birds most of the time, okay? So that's Bates mimicry. So Bates mimicry is when a harmless or tasty, so harmless and or tasty mimics something that is harmful and or gross. Okay, so that's Bates mimicry. Mullerian mimicry is when um, everybody is harmful, <laughs> right? So both are harmful or gross, okay? Um, and we see this in lots of species. So, um, you know, this whole like black white coloration is common in bees and wasps and all kinds of bugs, right? Because it's, they're, mim they're, they're mimics of each other, right? So it's, it sends a really clear message like, yeah, I'm one of the black and yellow ones. Don't mess with me, I'll sting you, right? So it's like a warning, okay? And by mimicking each other, right? It sort of makes the message clearer, right? So it doesn't matter which black and white thing I mess with, I'm gonna get stung by all of them, right? So I'm just gonna learn as a, as a you know, predator, I'm gonna learn not to mess with them. And honestly, I have to say, in my, in my life, I have owned a lot of dogs. Almost every dog I've owned, whether it was as, when I was a kid or into an adult, almost every dog I've ever had, at some point when they're a puppy, they eat a bee. It's flying around their head, <laughs> they bite it, they get stung on the face, <laughs> right? Face swells up. That dog never eats a bee again, <laughs> right? They learn, okay? And like I said, almost every single one of my dogs got stung by a bee one time. And after that, that dog doesn't mess with anybody that's black and yellow stripes, it's bad news, okay? Um, Here's a fun example. So clearly we're dealing with a mimicry situation. We have two different kinds of snakes, okay? Um, but the question we're asking here is, is this Batesian mimicry or is it Mullerian mimicry? And so this is kind of an interesting puzzle actually because one of these snakes is incredibly venomous and nasty. The other one is completely harmless and sweet. So when I tell you, it doesn't, and it doesn't matter which one's which, right? But Right, so one of them is harmful and one of them is okay, is fine, right? Doesn't, I mean, it'll bite you, but right, it's not venomous. So we're talking about Batesian mimicry, yeah? Okay, so one of these is a coral snake, that's the venomous one. The other one is a um, king snake, okay? And so the way to tell the difference out in nature, by the way, you should never try to touch a snake unless you really know what it is, especially around here, because we have so many different kinds of venomous snakes. That applies in other places too. Um, so the phrase is, red touches yellow, kill a fellow. Red touches black, friendly jack. So which one's which? Red touches yellow, kill a fellow. Red touches black, friendly jack. So the one on the left is a king snake. The one on the right is a, is a coral snake. And I've, I've used this little you know, thing. Um, last spring, last fall, not this, yeah, it was last, gosh, it was last, yes, it was one year ago. Um, I was out in the field with my uh, field biology class and um, somebody found a baby snake and I was like, don't touch it, don't touch it. Cause I tell, I warn them. I'm like, don't you touch anything without asking me first. Uh, <laughs> so they're like, baby snake. And I come over and I was like, ooh, that's a king snake. And I knew it was because red touches black friendly Jack. So, so I picked it up and um, it was really mad. It like pooped on me and it was like pissed off, but it didn't bite me, which was nice because I was ready. I was prepared. I was like, this is so cool. I'm going to show my students. So I was ready to, I was going to take one for the team, um, but they're non-venomous, which is why I was willing to do that. Anyway, so I picked it up so they could look at it and then I let it go.
Try not to harass animals too much, okay? Be nice. Anyway, just when you were thinking that plants were not, did not have any defenses against herbivores, they do, right? So there's lots of physical protections like having spines, right? So, you know, think about a cactus, right? Or any kind of spiny, pokey, or like really tough plant. Um, but another um, type of defense that a lot of plants have is chemical defenses. And so you will notice all three of the ex these examples, peppermint cloves, and this stupid thing is in the way. I wonder why that's there. Anyway, this is cinnamon, the bottom one. So all three of those species we use as seasonings. Why do we use them as seasonings? Because they make chemicals that are strong flavors right? So bugs don't like peppermint. Bugs do not like peppermint. We enjoy a little peppermint here and there, right? But bugs don't eat peppermint. So peppermint plants, the reason they make that oil that tastes like mint is to protect themselves from insects eating them, right? Same thing with cloves, okay? Same things with, same thing with cinnamon, right? Cinnamon is kind of like hot, hot, spicy, right? Um, I always think about the cin stupid cinnamon challenge that was going around for a while whatever. Um, we enjoy it because in small quantities, it tastes good to us. It tastes interesting, right? But, um, but it's, her, herbivores don't like it, right? So plants make all, it bitterness when you have plants that are super bitter, like um, Brussels sprouts. Historically, we're really bitter. Nowadays, they're not so much because we've bred a lot of the bitterness out of them. But a lot of wild plants are really bitter. Even if they're edible, they taste really bitter um, because the plant doesn't want to get eaten. <sighs> Anyway, okay. All right, one last predator topic and then we're done with this video. Okay, so our last predator topic, I'm gonna tell, I'm gonna tell you a little story. Um, and <laughs> we, we, we like to call this by we, I mean me, the Pisaster disaster because the name of the critter that we're talking about, the scientific name is Pisaster. So, um, Pisaster is a genus of um, sea stars, right? People typically call them starfish. They are not fish. So really, we should call them sea stars. Anyway, so a biologist in the late sort of, you know, mid 60s to the mid 70s thought it would be really interesting to learn about the dynamics between species in coastal intertidal. So once again, kind of like our barnacle story last time was in intertidals, right? So you have these rocks and the tide is up and then the tide is down and then the tide is up and then, right? So they're exposed to air and not. And um, Rocky intertidal habitats are really interesting because they can be quite diverse, right? They can have all different kinds of species that, that live in them. And so, this particular um, biologist, his name was Robert Payne. Um, you don't need to know that. I'm just, I have these things in my head and, and like I need to spew them out sometimes. Uh, he thought, well, wouldn't it be interesting to see what would happen if we remove a predator from a habitat, right? So what effect would there be if I set up, you know, two plots and in one plot, I just, you know, that was my control group. I just left it alone to do it, you know, be normal, right? And would occasionally come in and, you know, look at species diversity. How many different species do I have here? What's my biodiversity of this area? And then in another place, I actively removed the pisaster, the sea stars, right? So whenever you saw one, you removed it. Whenever you saw one, you removed it, right? So actively removed pisaster, okay? And what he found was actually pretty remarkable. So you might be thinking to yourself, well, if we remove the predator, then all of the prey species would become more abundant, right? Like that seems really logical, okay? It turns out that is not what happened at all. What actually happened is, so our control group is the black line, right? So here's our black line. And so he started, I can't see it because a stupid thing, stupid thing is in my way. Can I make that go away? Uh, no, I'm, a, I'm afraid I'm gonna screw something up. So I'm not going to, right? So anyway, um, so whenever he started, right? There were, what is that? 16 different species present 
right? And in the control group, it stayed about the same. It went up a little bit, up to 20, okay? But over the course of 10 years, that's not crazy, right? From 16 or 17 to 20, okay? But what he found that was really, really interesting is in the plot where he removed the pisaster, it actually started with one more species present than the control group did. They were close, but one more. And within three years, right, the number of species that were present in that area plummeted down to two and then one, right? So what happened? Why did that happen? The disaster. disaster. All right, so what happened was it turns out that pisaster is what we call a keystone species or specifically a keystone predator. Um, and what that means is that their role in the ecosystem is more significant than other organisms in the ecosystem. And so they call them keystone. The name keystone comes from this, right? So if you back before we invented cement. If you were gonna build a stone arch, right? The way that you would get those blocks to stay together is you would put an angled block in the top. My drawing is terrible, but you get the idea. An angled block in the top. And when you push that in, what it does is it pushes on the rest of the arch thereby basically supporting the whole arch, okay? And so they call that a keystone, the stone that you put in the top. And so we call these keystone species because essentially they hold the community together, right? So without them, some sort of disastrous thing would happen to the community. And so what happens in Pisaster, as it turns out, is um, sea stars are amazing predators. They're not very fast. Most predators are fast. They're not particularly fast, but you don't have to be fast if your prey doesn't move, as it turns out, right? So sea stars don't move fast, but they're very strong, right? And so their favorite food is mussels, right? So mussels are little, they're bivalves, like little clams kind of, and they attach to a surface. And so what um, sea stars do is they slowly crawl over to the mussel. Mussels can't move. They're attached to the surface. And basically what sea stars do is they have these little tiny suction cups on their underside and they attach those little suction cups to the mussel. They pry the mussel open just enough. And then, this is the coolest part, then the sea star pukes its stomach in its own stomach, right? It like, <laughs> like turns its stomach inside out, inside of the muscle, digests the muscle, and then slurps its stomach and all of the digested muscle back into its body. Goes about its business. <laughs> this is a slow process, but it's an effective process, okay? So what happened in the habitat where we removed the pisaster. So when pisaster is present, you have this beautiful, oh, look at this beautiful, diverse community. There's all kinds of different organisms. Here. Oh, 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 sorry. All right, there's all kinds of different organisms here. Isn't that lovely? If we take away the pisaster, guess what happens? Pretty quickly, since nobody's eating the mussels, and it turns out mussels are really good competitors, as it turns out, right? So the role of the pisaster is it essentially keeps the mussels in check. So they are such a good competitor that if there is not a predator there for them, they will quickly take over an area in just a matter of a couple of years, right? Everything else will disappear, right? And it'll just be muscles, just muscles, right? And so, yeah. And so um, sea stars are really important because they help keep the muscle population down so that other things can survive there right? Um, there are actually, as it turns out, lots of different keystone species. Often they're predators, not always, okay? Um, but we often talk about keystone predators because a lot of times the, the apex predator in an ecosystem is a keystone predator. So another good example is um, wolves. So in various different places in the western U.S., if you take wolves out of an ecosystem, 
right, out of the habitat. You take wolves out. What happens is you have this like cascading event of all kinds of problems with other species that ultimately don't just change you know, the species, but ultimately change the land. And so I think this might have been in the evolutionary arms race too. I can't remember. It's in one of the videos I like to show. I can't remember if it's in that one. Um, but if you take wolves out, what ends up happening is you end up with more deer because wolves like to eat deer. If you have more deer, you end up having um, the plants get overgrazed right? And so the plants get hit pretty hard. Well, if you overgraze plants, right, then you end up with plants, you know, not enough plants. So you end up with erosion, right? The soil runs off. You end up with problems with, um, you know, beaver dams changing the, the shape of a river, right? And it has all of these, it's like the butterfly effect, right? It has all of these effects sort of downstream related to just the removal of one species, right? And so predators are often have often have these really influential roles on um, a community, which is why I always like to talk about keystone species during the predator section, okay? Um, so that is basically it for this video. I do wanna show you this little table that I actually really like because it does a cool um, like comparison here. Um, I will mention though, that, so it's like the positive negative thing, right? What I will mention though, is that only some of these are symbiotic. So I'm gonna write an S next to the ones that are symbiotic. So that's symbiotic, that's symbiotic, that's symbiotic, okay? Essentially predation and herbivory are the same thing. They're just one, you know, what, who you're eating. Are you eating an animal or are you eating a plant? But the, it's the same general idea, okay? And then competition is a negative-negative relationship, right? So when two species or even individuals within the same species are competing for resources, it's negative for everyone, okay? So anyway, all right, so there's kind of like a nice little summary. This would be a good thing to think about, right? Especially if we in, um, during our Zoom, spend a little bit of time thinking about some of these examples. So anyway, okay. All right. I think that's it for this one. Okay. All righty.